Hi there, and welcome to Sean Cameron Photographic. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, digital cameras, we are bombarded with information. It's through the viewfinder, it's on the rear screen, it's on the top screen. In fact, a digital camera often gives us far more information than we would ever need. Whereas most film cameras, we were limited to the very essentials. Most of the information is derived from the various knobs and dials that we have actually set ourselves. Now, today, I'm going to be looking at two film cameras, and they're at the either end of that spectrum. I'm looking at the Hi-Tech Pro F5, and the amateur, low-cost F65. Now, both cameras were popular in the early 2000s. The F65 isn't just considerably smaller than the F5. It cost a fraction of the price too. About 12%, in fact. That's partially because the F5 was Nikon's most expensive consumer film camera. At the time of launch, they described it as the multi-award winning Nikon F5, the benchmark against which all other SLR cameras are judged. Housed in an aluminium alloy body with titanium viewfinder, the F5 is intelligent, fast and tough enough for the most challenging of assignments. In comparison, <laughs> when the F65 was released, they said, the F65 is so automatic and easy, you hardly have to think about a thing. So I guess the question is, as someone who's well known for wanting total control of his equipment, why on earth did I buy this F65 20 odd years ago? Well, I guess the answer probably is because I was skint and the F65 was pretty low end and cheap. I mean, according to Ken Rockwell, it was about $300 with a lens. I think I paid about 200 quid for it, and that was with a quick, with a kick lens. Now, in comparison, the F5 went for $3,000 plus. That's just over £4,500 in today's economy. Mind you, with the D6 retailing for over £6,000 and the new Z9 rumoured to cost the same, Maybe we're used to paying more for our gear. That's a discussion for another day. Talking of money, let's take a look at what these two cameras, what do we get for our hard earned DOSH 20 odd years ago? Well, both cameras have a cross ranged five area AF system. Focus tracking, don't get excited four exposure modes, centre-weighted metering. Now on top of that, the F5 has choice of dynamic AF and single area AF. It can shoot an impressive eight frames a second. That's a film camera, eight frames a second. It's got 3D colour matrix metering, spot metering, 3D multi-sensor balance fill flash ca capability. It's got custom settings with 24 functions and it's compatible with four finders, 14 focusing screens and two camera backs. And on top of that, it's built like a brick outhouse. The F65, the little F65, has a choice of dynamic AF and close to subject priority dynamic AF. This, I quote, automatically maintains focus on the subject closest to any of the five focus areas and focus is locked once it's achieved. If the subject moves from the selected focus area before focus lock, the camera automatically focuses on the subject, determining the data from the other focus areas. I told you not to get excited, it's not focus tracking as we understand it today. This little camera also has 
3D matrix metering with the right lenses, five vary programs, matrix balanced fill flash capability, and can do an exciting 2.5 frames per second. The Nikon F5 was released in 1996 and continued to sell until 2004, and the F65 was introduced in 2001 and was available right up to 2009. Mind you, by then, digital had taken the ball and was massively dominating the game. The poor old film cameras were left to clean out the changing rooms. Did I extend, did I overextend that theme a little bit? I probably did. Never mind. So apart from a couple of things, there's no huge difference between those cameras so far on paper. Well, certainly not enough to warrant the 88% price difference between the two of them. So let's take a look, a closer look at the buttons and the dials. Starting with the F65. Now, on the front of the F65, we've got the focus mode selector. And that's this little lever here. You get manual and you get autofocus. It's important to note that there's no selection button to, less, to press like the, the newer Nikons. You get a lens release button here, and then you've got a little button just hidden there which allows you to choose which focus point you want by holding the button down and then turning the rear dial. And then you've got the flash sync mode button there. You've got the depth of field button, preview button here, the remote sensor, AS assist, red, eye, red light, uh, red eye, <laughs> uh, reduction, and uh, on the top you've got your top dial. Now this is all important because this is where you get the majority of your adjustments. Um, in the top dial, you've got manual, aperture, priority, shutter priority, program, auto, program mode, landscape mode, macro, sports, night time, self-timer. Get the message. Then you've got your bracketing, multiple exposure button, film rewind button, though it seems to do it itself, to be quite honest with you. On the other side, you've got your exposure compensation. Obviously, your shutter on and on-off switch and an LCD panel. Now the LCD panel shows shutter speed, aperture, battery, focus area, frame counter. It also shows exposure compensation. Okay, onto the rear of the camera. You've got your rear dial and you've got a little window to show us what film is in the camera. That's it for the little, uh, the little F65. Right, let's compare that to the F5. Now, there's a fair bit on this camera and I will forgive you just this once, but only this once, if you wanna fast forward. But why would you? Because it's fascinating. Because on the front, we have the front or sub command dial. We've got the depth of view preview. We've got the mirror lockup, which is there. We've got vertical shutter release, we've got sync connector for computer, we've got lens release button, we've got the focus mode selector again without the button, but with this time you get continuous single and manual. And on top, you've got your film advanced or frames per second as we now call it. And you can choose single, continuous low, continuous high, silent, timer, You've got your little film re rewind handle, but you'll never use it. And then you've got the release for the camera back. I won't press it because I've got film in it. You've got the camera film advance and the release button for the FPS dial, the frames per second dial, which is just there. You've got a diopter adjustment, metering and release button, multiple exposure. Then you've got your shutter release on off switch power switch obviously release button because nothing's done without its belt and braces on these camera af area mode exposure mode exposure compensation we go to the back you've got the film rewind button you've got another one just here you've got your viewfinder release button 
eyepiece shutter lever, auto exposure, auto focus lock, AF start button, rear main command dial, focus area selector, AF vert vertical start button, 10 pin remote, and you've got a little rear LCD panel that shows the information. And under this little flap here, and anyone familiar with the D1 will recognize that, you get ISO, flash sync, auto exposure, flash exposure, shutter speed, aperture, focus area lock, and custom setting menu, though not necessarily all at the same time. And we'll just pop that back up again. Isn't that cute? It's magnetic. I think we can see that the F5 has a lot more buttons, levers, and dials, and that means flexibility. That means that we can do more with this. So I guess that's what you get for your money. That is the extra cash. Now I just thought it might be quite interesting if to show you what they look like through the viewfinder. And I'm gonna bring the F4 into this as well because I thought that would be quite fascinating. So let's have a look through the viewfinder. Starting with the F4, it has various viewfinders. I'm actually using the DP20, which is the standard model. I've noticed the aspect is slightly squarer than the other two cameras. The information is a little hard to read as well, and you have to move your eye position to see it. Sometimes it disappears completely if you haven't got it quite right. Looking through the D65 viewfinder at a darker subject, it's actually quite hard to tell whether it's in focus or not due to the viewfinder being so dim. The info that you get is limited to the shutter speed, focus mode, and dependent on which lens is attached, the f-stop number. The F5 is quite modern, definitely a theme with this camera. It compares really favorably with the viewfinder of the D1, D2X, and the D3. As an advisory to anyone using modern lenses with these older cameras, I needed to fix the focus lock off when I use my 70 to 200 and 300 lenses. Otherwise they stopped autofocus in all three cameras. Now it's time to see what they can do in the field. Earlier I slapped a 300 mil 2.8 lens on the F5, pocketed the F65 and grabbed the F4 just to keep them both company. I need little excuse. And then went birding. I used the cameras at different times during the day and the weather was quite good during the early part of the morning. When it came to shoot this part of the film, however, the F4 struggles with the focus when it's not faced with a solid object. For instance, there's branches in front and you're shooting through a small gap. It seems to struggle and it hunts a bit. But it does sound gorgeous, doesn't it? It is a sexy piece of engineering. That's the sound of 5.7 frames per second. Because I've got the MB21 battery pack on board as opposed to MB20 that it actually would standardly come with. That only did four. But it's a film camera. 5.7 frames per second for a camera that's a quarter of a century old. Okay, I'm back with the F5 now. And to be quite honest, it's quite a relief that I can choose which focus mode, single or continuous I want by using the little switch to the bottom left of the lens. Also using single focus point, I can similarly choose which one I want to use. Although oddly there's a little delay in selecting the focus point on the selector switch and it actually moving. It's quite easy to get frustrated and move it too far. But as you've only got three focus points in a row to play with, it can only ever go really one too far. So it's not too bad. 
This whole camera make, definitely feels more positive and the experience gives me much more confidence. I did find myself cursing the receded button for the exposure compensation. It has definitely cost me shots. I think I'm getting used to it now. But to be absolutely honest, it can be also a bit difficult to determine whether you're pressing which button because you're pressing them so hard. And they both, all the buttons feel exactly the same when, you're, when your eyes in the viewfinder. So it's hard to tell whether you're using exposure compensation button or the program button. And after a while you've pressed the button so hard you lose all sense of feeling anyway. But what have we got here? Now I'm going to give you the 8 frames a second F5 experience. Doesn't that sound glorious? Oh, it's easy to use too much film. So here I am in the snow with the F65. And all I can hear is a gentle tap, tap, tap as the snow hits my hood. I've got to say, looking through the viewfinder, it's like focusing through muslin. It's so hard to see if it's in focus. I guess it's worth mentioning that this was my first SLR without a focusing screen, as it was expected to be used with an AF lens. The biggest problem I've had for these doing these birds, and this gorgeous little robin just turned up, the biggest problem I've got doing these birds is that an AF assist illuminator, as they call it, a little light on the front of the camera keeps coming on every time you press the shutter. And there doesn't appear to be a way of switching it off. It doesn't seem to be putting the birds off. So you've heard the shutter from the F5 and the F4. And they're quite impressive. A gorgeous mechanical sound. Of the F4 and a gorgeous fast seven frames per second from the F5. <laughs> the F65 sounds quite apologetic in comparison. It sounds like it's apologising to me every time it takes a shot. I'm sorry I missed that shot. I'm sorry I didn't quite focus there. It's the most apologetic little shutter I think I've ever heard. And the focus on it, it just does not want to focus. It wants to focus on anything but what I wanted to focus on. I'm definitely missing shots with this camera. And there are times it won't, it won't even focus at all. You're actually pressing the button and nothing's changing, it's not even hunting. It's very frustrating when you can see a shot and it just disappears into a blurry nothingness. I find myself pre-focusing on a branch and then hoping something lands on it. Unlike the other two where they, they miss occasionally, but you can get there in the end. I don't have a lot of confidence in this camera. I'm sorry I can't focus properly. It needs to be apologetic. It's all right when there's nothing else around, when there's nothing else to distract it. The one thing I have noticed with these three cameras, they 
They've all got different films in them, 100, 400, and then 800. And I'm really hyper aware of the alternating light this afternoon. I find myself changing cameras every time it clouds over. So move to the 800. And when the sun comes out, I move back to the 100. Am I overreacting? I guess I won't know until I get the images back. In fact, I may not be giving enough respect to each film's latitude for success. I won't know until I see the pictures. Oh, go on, get the shot. And now I am run out of film. Well, that scared all the birds away. Definitely don't get that with a digital camera, do you? Hmm. Right, enough of this. I'm getting cold. I'm off to the studio. Now, all the pictures I've done so far have been from the Kodak and Fuji print film. I finally realised that to get the best quality from these two cameras, I have to use slide or reversal film. So I've come to the studio to give it a whirl. Let's look at the results we can get from Kodak Ektar 100 and Fuji Provia 100 in both the F5 and the F65. Okay, so we're in the studio and it looks like something's already gone astray. So what can it be? Why have I got my head in the diffuser? This looks like number 23 in the catalogue of Cameron cockups. Now the first problem I have is that the F5 and the F65 don't support my flash trigger for my studio. So I'm gonna to have to use this flash gun and set the studio lights to slave. Now that means that it'll trigger where my speed light does. So the use of my light meter has never been so important. This is gonna be fascinating. I hadn't even thought about this. Due to the time it took to adapt and change the system, and the uncertainty of the results, especially from the F65, I didn't want to waste the Ektar 100 and chose only to shoot with the Fuji Chrome Provia 100. I normally love this film as it can produce some stunning results such as this Robin, but in the studio the lighting seemed to magnify Fuji's tendency to a green cast. Interesting to note that the two cameras give the same results, but why wouldn't they? There's no white balance adjustment on film cameras, so it's down to the film again. The advantage nowadays is that I can adjust these in Lightroom and they should come out okay. They're all sharp and capture his expression really well. In fact, here are those images before and after Lightroom. Yes, they're not perfect, but they're perfectly acceptable. There's almost an ethereal feel to film that you don't get with digital. It's hard to define, but it's definitely there. When I left the studio, I thought it would be an interesting time to test the cameras in awkward lighting, so I decided on some portraits. The F65 and the F5 were both using Kodak 200 film, and the F4 had Kodak 400. I really wasn't that impressed with the 200, but the 400 is absolutely stunning. Back when the weather was better, I'd taken some shots of the dogs jumping. All three cameras are packing Kodak 200 film. Here's the F4, it's spot on. Look at the sharp focus on the eyes. Next, the F65 has nailed it as well. Finally, the F5. And yes, I'm afraid that I failed with it. Could it be me? Could it be the camera? Go on. I know what you're thinking. It was me. Let's have a closer look at some of those previous images side by side. Now I defy you to tell the difference between the two cameras. The birds also used Fuji 200 film, or rather I did. I hope you enjoyed that. Now I'm using a new company to process the film. They then email me the digital version. All in all, I'm rather impressed. On Monday morning, I popped the films into my local post office. Early on Tuesday afternoon, my images were emailed over. It's that quick. Now, whilst that's not exactly 
check the back of the camera, then run home to download the pictures fast, by film standards, that's still pretty speedy. I guess the only way to speed the whole process up would be, of course, to process them myself. And you know, that may well be a possibility in the future. As for now, I'll, st I'll stick to what I'm doing. One of the things I found the most odd was when I was loading the film into the F65, I was surprised to discover that I couldn't set the ISO. It's actually set automatically using the DX code. The camera's set to use ISO 25 to 5000, and with no provision for manual setting, you just have to hope that it chooses the right one. This is truly an auto everything camera. The main difference between the three cameras, and yes, I'm gonna drag the F4 into it again, because that camera makes me plan every single shot. The light, the composition, and consequently, the settings that I set. Before I even raise the camera to my eye, I've planned the shot. The F65, on the other hand, I simply throw it to my eye, press the button. Yes, there's exposure compensation, and yes, I use it. But I'm not really in control of the camera, and that tends to make you a tad lazy. It certainly makes me lazy. And it's the polar opposite of the F4. The do-it-all camera, the F65, makes you inclined not to care so much about the shot. There's no feeling of, well, there's nothing I can do anyway. That's how you feel, there's nothing I can do anyway. Using the F5 feels really familiar, and I know I keep saying that. In fact, it's so much like using a modern digital camera that I keep looking at the back to check the histogram. And yes, I chimp as well. The buttons and switches are pretty much where I expect them to be. And it's almost the same as the D5 that I use in my daily job. They really haven't changed that much from the F5. Oddly, the D1 from 1999 feels a lot older, more clunky and somewhat antiquated compared to the F5. Do you know, even though it was released a good three years later. But there's one thing I've realized by using film rather than digital is that we rely on past information gathered by the camera to make future decisions. What I mean by this is, it's all very easy for us to look at a good or bad digital image, taken years ago maybe, look at the EXIF info and see what the settings were. And you can see the settings for the individual shot, whether it was one you've just shot or years ago. When you shoot film, there's no such record kept. Unless, of course, you, you make them like yourself, like I used to as a kid, and write it down on a piece of paper with the frame number. So as I say, unless you remember them from the viewfinder readout and the position of the dials, they're lost forever. If you use the F65 in shutter priority, you tend not to get the f-stop anyway. Well, sometimes you do, it depends what lens you're using. Maybe with the modern lenses it doesn't. I can't find the, the lens that it came with. I was desperately trying to just sort it out. Sorry, I'm, I'm really irritated by my hair. <laughs> Lockdown hair, you see. Now, have I answered the question that I posed in previous videos? Remember it? Does a pro film camera take better shots than a lower spec model? Now, I guess I summed it up earlier, really, when I said that the film camera can only ever expose the film whether it's a simple pinhole camera or a high-tech monster like this one. The color quality of the prints is largely dictated by the film and to a lesser degree, the processing. But the control and the opportunity, now that's down to the camera. The D5 is a fantastic camera. The F5 follows that example. It gives me a far better chance to get the shot. The focus system, the metering system, and the frames per second alone give me a head start. Now let's talk about longevity. 
If I accidentally drop the F5, it'll most likely bounce and make a nasty, nasty dent in whatever it's landed in. I don't recommend it, by the way. If I drop the F65, I'll need a new camera. So if I had the chance to go back 20 years, would I tell my younger self to step away from the F65 and keep on saving for the F5? No. It served a very useful purpose at the time and paid for its cost 50 times over in earnings. Now I was envious of the guys that got to use the cameras like the F4 and the F5. But my time has come and I tell you what, I love them both. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining me again. And you know what I'm gonna say? If you liked it, then please like it. And if you really liked it, why don't you try on that subscribe button? Because you know it's gonna suit you. I look forward to seeing you soon when I'm probably gonna do a slightly more modern camera. Take care and look after yourself. Thank you.